welcome back. This is our second speaker, uh, Carlos Lerma. Many of us call him a good friend. He's been coming to CornCon since the very beginning. And uh, most people kind of think know him as the guy that wears the corn cob hat. And we just appreciate it from day one. He's never stop, always entertaining. That's it. Hit him up afterwards for autographs. They'll be valuable someday. Well, anyways, good morning. How are you guys doing? I can't hear you. Great. There we go. There we go. I thought I walked into a funeral parlor or something. Well, anyways, uh, my name is Carlos. I'm going to be talking about an existential crisis from an architecture, a superior architecture point of view. I'm going to ad lib a lot of this stuff I usually do. So feel free to, you know, cut in, interrupt, ask me any questions you might have. Why are we talking about this? Um, especially because security architecture is one field that. Is getting a lot of exposure, is getting a lot of traction nowadays. We are sitting right between the business and security. We're trying to think about things in a different way. To try all these neat little gizmos and stuff that we used to play for every single day into a business plan, integrate them into a business um, landscape. And that's pretty much what I'm here to talk about, right? Honest. Uh, the views here are my own, do not represent those of uh, employment. And by the way, I'm not an expert. I'm just like you guys. I am sitting in a desk every single morning trying to figure things out, uh, bumping my head against a whole bunch of stuff and asking a lot of questions. So pretty much if you're looking for an expert thing, uh, to talk, this is not it. There's going to be much more of uh, an exchange of ideas and trying to wrap our heads around a lot of concepts. Okay? So what are we talking about here? So what is exactly security architecture? Why do we need security architects? We're going to go through three existential crises. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about experience and what is the road ahead for us in the next couple of uh, years. Next, please. So, what is security architecture? It's about architecture, bro. Like the thing that's the thing now. Go ahead. So, what it is? It's a design artifact that describes how the security tools are positioned, how they relate to the overall IT architecture. The main purpose is to maintain the system's quality and attributes. Pretty much a 10,000 feet view of how security fits into, let's just say, the business landscape or the systems landscape of an organization. Once you start thinking about architecture, you start thinking about the whole, the whole of the organization, and how security is going to be embedded into certain aspects of that organization. Specifically, this is very useful when you start talking about a specific topic, let's just say, how are we going to secure IoT inside of the enterprise? What is it that I need to secure IoT if I implement that inside of an organization? Well, I'm going to need um, logging, multi-factor authentication. I'm going to need encryption. I'm going to need encryption at rest and in motion. I'm going to need um, logging of uh, com um, compelling events. All those things. That's you're pretty much going up, 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 and then you're looking at the big picture from an architectural standpoint. How you're going to address those main points. But this is the time when you get to play with those components and see which ones operate or integrate better with the landscape that you are studying or you're trying to analyze. So that includes a model, a graphical representation of how security is built into the general landscape, like I said. Most of the time, this is, um, this is achieved in, in a very general form if you've ever seen, let's like, say, the Purdue model for industrial control systems. That's pretty much a big graphical rep uh, representation of industrial systems, right? Once you take that model and you turn it into an a security architecture model, you're pretty much putting security building blocks inside of that big architectural common model, okay? Uh, so as, uh, as I said, it can be specific uh, to a part of the general IT ecosystem. It might be cloud services, it might be the databases, it might be network software, whatever and you're going all the way up instead of going down to specific components. Next. And then, when you think you got it all covered, boom, it finally hits you that this is way worse than it is. Next. This is a very good insight on what is it that you have to understand when it comes to security from a general form in any single architecture. This is the CISO, uh, what's called CISO mind map from SANS. 
I stumbled across this piece of knowledge maybe a couple years ago, and when I saw this, it blew my mind. So in order to get somewhere when it comes to security from that 10,000 feet view, this is only a small taste of what you actually have to think about when you put the security lens into anything within IT. Any sort of aspect of the IT ecosystem. This is the stuff that you might have to consider. As a matter of fact, this is very adaptable. You can take a lot of these things out as you wish, but most of these will be involved in that analysis. And this is the, type, this is the, the, the sort of stuff that an architect tries to play with every day. How many of these things have I actually considered? How many of these things have I actually analyzed when it comes to the general IT ecosystem? Next, please. Now, oh, this is a good one. This takes me all the way back to PornCon 1 uh, five years ago. Does anybody in here, raise your hand if you know where this came from? No one? No one? You do. Where did it come from? Uh, no, that was, no, that was Bob Gates. No, but that, that's perfect. That, that's a matter of fact, that's, that, it, it's very, very close to the actual one. Got, Bob Gates gets to Afghanistan, and he asks for you know, the general situation on what, uh, you know, what the forces are doing, what the, what the general picture is, and someone has the great idea of going, like, no, we need to go with the, with the one power, with one slide PowerPoint so we can understand. And they come up with this. <laughs> Holy cow, man. Like this, this he, he's a very smart guy. He, he speaks with like perfect Russian and he's got like two PATs and stuff. He had to stop and say, I need a minute to figure this out. <laughs> and and I, I don't blame him. I, I would do the exact same thing. This is this is sort of like the way that the security architecture integrates with the whole thing. Your boss comes in, there's a stakeholders meeting, there's a you know a meeting of the board, you're the CISO, or you're the guy pretending to be the CISO. And Someone says, can you give me a general explanation of how the security posture in this organization is? Right there. <laughs> this, is, this is what most people go for. And yes, you might, you might have some very, very smart people sitting on that room. But the main point is, it is that convoluted, it is that complicated, and some of our objectives have to do with clarifying how security plays within the general picture. Right? And I'm going to tell you how to do that, but as I said, this is, more, this is more of an art than a science. It takes a lot of refinement, it takes a very, very uh, specific skill set that cannot be taught. You mostly get this from the day-to-day -day of your security operations, from years of working in IT, working in security, working in managerial positions. But this is what we're going to try to get to. Next, please. Why do we need security arch uh, architects in here? That's what we're going to try to explain. Of course, we're going to help you out with the cycle phase, right? But I'm still going to help you out. Thanks. This is why we need security architects. First of all, because we need to build security into business goals and processes. The best way to build security from an architectural perspective is to build it within business processes. It's better to build it from the ground up instead of having to bolt it on later on many stages down the road, right? And that is an iterated process. You actually have to sit down with people and ask them, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What business goal are you trying to accomplish? Because at the end of the day, the reason why we buy all these nice security gizmos is not for us to play them with. It's not for us to like break them. No, it's actually because we want to achieve a business goal within, within an organization. And that is the first step in order to get our um, architectural career off the ground. What is it that I can do to understand security from the ground up? Provide a solid overview of security to business stakeholders, like I just said, is pretty much on how you explain that to uh, a bunch of people that do not know about security, sometimes they don't even care about security, but you actually have to sit there and explain that to them. And on the other hand, you have to sit with the technical guys and tell them, the reason why you're doing this from your security posture is because you're contributing to these business objectives. Obviously, it's not easy because there's people that sit there doing business stuff and there's people that sit there doing technical stuff. But you still have to deliver the message. Identify major risk in IT projects. Oh my God, this is 
This is so much fun. But on the other hand, it's a pain in the ass. Why? Because you got to understand about risk. Sometimes you think, well, I'm securing things, I'm doing my, my technical stuff, I'm thinking about firewalls, and I'm thinking about you know, um, Wi-Fi protected access, and I'm doing all that kind of stuff. But I do not know how to put that in terms that people can understand how risky it is what I'm defending. And for that, you need a risk model. What else we got here? Provide security solution that fits budgets. Who's ever had that problem? Raise your hand. Of course. That's, that's pretty much the everyday type of thing, right? Or identify existing solutions that can be reused or can be repurposed, which is pretty much what we call uh, application rationalization. I got all these applications in here that I don't know what they, what they do. We need to reduce the, the, the number of those so we can actually lower the cost of ownership but we can still make the company more secure by doing so. Control the future. Rage Against the Machine, man. Control the past, control the future. Remember that song? If you do, you might be in the borderline between Gen X and Millennial. Good for you. There we go. Why? If you can actually understand where you're going by understanding where you came from, you might have a shot of actually making sense of all this stuff. Provide high level analysis, a multiple source of information, the intelligence cycle, anyone. How are you positioning your sources? How are you analyzing the information that you're getting from other peers within the organization? How is that helping you understand where you're standing and where you need to go when in, ter when in terms of security and security um, architecture? And we got a lot of more, more things that we're going to talk about. But pretty much this is how you get started when it comes to understanding what security architecture is. This is the one that keeps me awake at night. This was this is like four days ago. Um, Bill, Bill Slater, this guy from Chicago, he's been a, a very good contributor to the security community, um, came up with this, uh, with this slide. And this is pretty much how much in a disadvantage we are as security practitioners. This is what the estimated damage is going to be, and this is how much we're spending to secure stuff. And most people are talking about that every single day. People are not willing to put the money and the effort in order to get to where we need to be. But, once again, we, even though we cannot tackle the problem overall, we're actually doing our part in evangelizing all this stuff within our organization. And this is one thing that we definitely need to keep in mind. Next, please. Anybody here? Steve Raybon out here? Thank you very much. You people are connoisseurs. So the existential crisis number one is, I'm standing! Got in the crossfire. I'm in the crossfire of two different trains of thoughts within the enterprise. The business and the technical security stuff. Next, please. So, this is what the suits do. This is all they care about. And don't worry about that. It's their job to take, to take care of that stuff, to worry about this stuff. This is what the business cares. Return of investment, quality, uptime, profit, uh, profit realization. How do I make more money? How do I penetrate market? How do I actually put a market in my, in my pocket before somebody gets there? How can I innovate? How can I make my products better? How can I get more consumers to buy my stuff or sign up for my services? This is the stuff that the business cares for. Now, next. This is what the hoodies do. We've all been out there, right? This is the stuff we love to do every day. We love to play with it. We love, we love to break it. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. We love doing this stuff, and that's the reason why we're here. Because we like talking about all this stuff. But like I said, there's a middle point. Next, please. One more. That's where you are. Like Frederick Nietzsche, man. You no, know, clench fist and like, you know, everything's lost, dude. This is where you are, right there. You're trying to bridge these two and make them understand what the purpose of the other one is. This stuff has impact in all this stuff and vice versa. And you're right here trying to figure out that relationship from an architectural standpoint. That's pretty much what you do every single day as an architect. Next, please. 
What's that? Into the void. Yeah, of course, into the void. If you're if you're able to walk out of it. Zizi Todd, there. You, sir, are gentlemen kind of sore. Thank you. There's another one right here. Thank you very much. We're risk thinkers, man. Now, we, now we're starting to think about risk. That's like I said, that's the next new tool that we need to start understanding that makes a difference between a social architect and someone that is, let's just say, getting there in terms of success. Next, please. You're a big boy now. Once you sign up for the architecture job, you're a big boy. You're thinking about risk now. You're thinking about stuff that an analyst doesn't usually think about, which is great. You're getting into a new realm of security. You're the first one to come in contact with. Because as an architect, it is your job to have a pipeline of work. And people are going, this is pretty much how it works in most organizations. People come in with a new project, any sort of IT project, or it can even be a business project. And they'll tell you, what do you think that we need in terms of security to make this thing happen? And you go through the whole thing. If you're actually lucky enough to get the data flow diagram, your architectural diagrams, you're pretty much going to start thinking about all the components of a system and how security was bolted in there, if it was, and if it wasn't, what is the need to secure every one of those components? That's how it's going to get to you. The intelligence cycle, once again, helps you a lot. Where are you positioning your information sources? Who are those people that you talk to in order to understand the project? Are you actually in that area where the project started? Do you know what it is all about? If you don't have them, how are you going to pull them in? Once you get that information, analysis, once you get that information, how are you going to make sense of it? What are, what are you going to compare it against? How are you going to verify its authenticity? How, do you, how, how are you going to um, come up with, uh, with, let's say, with trains of thought that make sense from the standpoint of what people are trying to do when they propose the solution. That's how the intelligence cycle is going to help you out. Then you're going to, then you're going to uh, generate information, you're going to give that to people who make decisions, and you're going to, make, you're going to, have, you're going to have to uh, make sure that those people use the information when they're supposed to be using it on time. You know how to classify information. The information classification is usually one of the first steps that allow you to start thinking about the level of security that you need. The, the good old question of how much money are you going to spend to secure a $10, $10 bill, right? If the information that is going through that system or through that initiative, is it that important? You actually need to ramp up things. Is it not that important? According to whom? According to the data owner? According to yourself? Some of those things are needed in order to understand how important that information might be. Quantitative versus qualitative, this is a great um, debate right now. A lot of people are saying that you need to ditch uh, qualitative in order to go to quantitative. That is not true. You might need to explain things quick and dirty and stuff, very, very analytical. Some people go like, don't give me the, don't give me the numbers just yet. Tell me where I am right now and we'll get to that right after that. Which reminds me of an example that I got from my sister. She's actually a, a graphic designer and she's also a fashion designer. She said that there's one thing about uh, garment sizes that make them very difficult for people to understand. And that is the fact that they are not made in a tailor-made way. They're not tailored to everybody. What Levi's does when they churn out like a thousand jeans, but just let's think about a pair of pants that it's 34 ways, 32 NC. If you go to Target and you pick four of those or five of those and you try them on, some of them are gonna fit and some of them are not going to fit, even though they're the same size. They're advertised the same size. Why? Because what they do is, in order to accommodate people with the same size but different body types, they use an, an use X number of patterns that are all look alike but not the same in order to accommodate all that people and sell more jeans. What, let's just say, fashionably conscious people do is they buy the jeans, but then they start tailoring. Well, they, they, they'll start adapting those those um. Um, those garments to their body because they know how to do that. They know what the trick to adapt that garment to their body is. Risk models are sort of like the same. You get one out of the box, and either can be that it doesn't fit, or one can fit close to where you are. 
So you need to start tailoring it to the needs of your organization. You start cutting here, you start pulling there, you start putting in more things that the, uh, the other model doesn't have, and you make it fit the organization, but that takes time. You need to get the stakeholders in and understand what the risk posture is in order to see if that model fits you. Who needs to know about it? Where is the information going to go? Is it going to go straight to your boss? Is it going to go all the way up to the board? Is it going to stay within the middle management? And it will affect the outcome of your work and the extent to which you can influence the decision maker. If, if this information is tailored right, if you actually make use of storytelling, which is a great resource, you might have a great shot of influencing someone. There are people in, 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 uh, in PortCon that are great at doing this. I highly, highly recommend that you attend my daughter's uh, presentation. He's a great storyteller. If I, I know that if I give Mike a, a topic, he can actually make sense of it. Why? Because he knows exactly how to frame that within a storytelling context and who to address that. That those two are great assets for anyone who's trying to tell a story about technology. And you need to keep that in mind. Like I said, this is not a one size fits all solution. You need to figure out how a risk model, how an architecture model fits within the organization that you're working on. Next, please. The existential crisis number three is where do we go from here? Where do we go from where we are to where we need to go? Next, please. This is where I need you to be very conscious of what is it that we're going after. I'll make it very easy for you. Next. This came out last year, 2018. These are the 30 technologies that are going to change life in the next decade. In 2018. Bear in mind that this can change by the month. Right? But this is a great point, this is a great starting point for someone to understand, okay, what's the road ahead? What do we need to start thinking about? All these little, nice, shiny, beautiful things, right? AI, IoT, mobile internet, blockchain, big data, automation, robots, immersive media, mobile technologies, cloud computing, 3D printing, keeps going on and on and on and on, right? Let me take an example of this. Number two, IoT. Who in here is working with IoT projects, ICS stuff? One, two, three, four, five. That's, thank you very much. That's great. It means that we're definitely seeing this as a, let's just say, as, a, as truth. A lot of people are saying, hey, you know what? I just, uh, in order to make a, a sales campaign better, I just saw that there's this new gizmo that I can uh, put them in the shelves in, in Walmart and me as a, let's say as a, as a supplier, I can actually put them in there and track movement so I know that people, is, people spend way more time in front of my product and I know that they're more likely to buy it. Great, and that's an IoT solution. Perfect, awesome. It will sell more of whatever you got. But one second, what the, the point is, how are you gonna secure that? When they sell that stuff to you, they can tell you how much profit you're going to realize. They're, they're going to tell you how much time you're going to spend installing it. And they're going to tell you what is it that you need to install that thing out there in the field. What they don't tell you is how you're going to secure it. Ha ha ha. And, what, and what's next? Then you're going to, they're going to start spending countless nights thinking about this crap. And going like, and then what am I going to do? Like, what am I really going to do? This is when you start putting an architectural framework or an architectural reference model into whatever gets thrown at you and you try to figure out what is it that you need to do. And it's going to be an everyday task. Because like I said, this crap pretty much changes by the month. God knows what's going to be in December or in February 20, uh, 2020 or whatever. Whatever comes in, you need to be able to start thinking about these things from a standpoint of what kind of risk can I see? And number two, how is that going to affect my business model, my organization? And there's also a very important thing in here, which is how to think about the future, right? Kristen Wheaton, he's a, a professor at the U.S. Army um, War College. He talks about how to think about the future. That's, it's a great, um, it's a, a series of three 
um, blog posts. You can actually look him up on, on Google. He writes about all that kind of stuff because uh, he's, um, he teaches intelligence analysis. And one of his jobs is pretty much to start thinking about the future. So when I came across that piece, he, start, he actually starts off by saying, you can either think about it or you can worry about it. You can be way more pessimistic about it or you can be way more realistic about it. If you try to combine a little bit about the two, you actually achieve that a little balance. You can actually be able to talk about those things as they come out of the assembly line, but you can also start thinking, what is the first thing that I need to worry about when they hit the shelves? And that is exactly where we're going. Next, please. Awesome. Thank you very much. You gotta throw that out. Woo! Thank you very much, yeah. So how does most people feel? Who, who knows what, where this is from? Yeah, there we go. Game over, man! It's over! A lot of you feel like that. Some, some of you, don't deny that, some of you get to the office in the morning and the, fir when the first thing they do is like throw you a problem. This is how you react. It's over, man. It's game over. This thing's blowing up the wall. And it's true. I feel like that a lot of times. But then this is how I feel afterward. They can't go anywhere, man. And they're like in front of me, in front of me at the rear, and it decides they can't go anywhere. More for me. Thank you very much. And this is a great, this is a great outlook to have. Don't be afraid of these things. Don't be afraid of the new challenges that new technologies are introducing to the environment for you to shine. But that's exactly what you're gonna be doing as a security architect. That's exactly what you're going to do as a security architect. You're going to have to think about new problems. And you're going to, you're going to start to think about new solutions that no one knows how to secure. But at this point, you might have been in this, in this industry long enough so that you know how to approach a problem without knowing what it looks like. And that's exactly what I'm trying to give you. A little bit of hope in the fact that a lot of things that you've done in, in your everyday job is pretty much what's going to help you, uh, you know, come victorious when it comes to new technologies. Okay. This slide doesn't have a single purpose, not even related to this presentation. <laughs> but, but, dude, I would totally love to be as happy as this day when my day, when my days are over. This is great. Now what's the road ahead? Well, I was just I was just talking about that. The road ahead is pretty much trying to make trying to make sense of new technologies that people are trying to harness in order to make the business way more profitable, to make it more um, attractive, to make it adapt to um, to newer consumers. And this was the first thing. Who remembers that movie Sneakers? Here. Thank you, thank you very much. That was, okay. That, those con the concepts in that movie. Come all the way back from like 1993. The fact that information is the most important currency. Information is the most important asset. Back in the day, it was only an afterthought. It was only a fantasy. Right now is the reality. Data analytics. The fact that I know exactly what someone wants. The fact that now I can actually quote unquote read people's minds and pretty much read people's feelings in terms of what do I want, what am I going to do next? What do I want to do? What do I crave? What I dislike? All those things from a commercial business perspective are perfect for me to understand. What do I need to do to get more profits? Do I need to develop a new product? Do I need to sell it to a new person? Do I need to sell it to a new demographic? Does that new demographic think different? All those things are massive amounts of data that we, start, that we need to start thinking about. But from a security standpoint, what do, we, that, what do we need to care? Are they subject to a regulatory framework? Are they sensitive enough so they need to be encrypted? Can they, can they be weaponized? Can they, can they use to, uh, to cause harm? All those things start ramping up, I'm sorry, um, ramping up the ante when it comes to the stuff that we do in, in our job. That is actually the road ahead, that's the first part. The other one is that we have to deal with massive amounts of complexity. And when we deal with that, we need to start constructing models. We need to start getting accustomed to working with stuff we don't know. 
trying to, try to make guesses, trying to make educated guesses. Risk management is great for that. So as, as long as you start understanding a risk model, how it works, and how you need to adapt it to your organization, that is going to be way more easier to work with. Especially because there's people that the first challenge that they have is pretty much figuring out something that they don't know anything about. That was one of the first challenges that I got thrown in one of my first big you know, jobs. How are you going to think about X, about X thing that you don't know anything about? You start constructing a, a model. And I think one of the most important ones that I've been thinking about quite, um, quite heavily in the, in the last couple of months is how are we going to prepare the next generation of security architects? Which is a job, like I said, it's a job that requires a lot of refinement in terms of thinking, doing, and acting. Well, like I said, there are a lot of you guys that have been out here in this industry for quite a long time. And you understand, maybe you understand this, maybe you understand security from a different standpoint than mine, or the guy right next to you. That's exactly what you need in order to be successful in this and form the next generation of architects. The fact that you can mentor someone to start thinking about things that they don't know about, but they can contribute because of their, their viewpoints, because of their experience, because of their demographics or age bracket or whatever it is. And in order to make this, um, let's just say, um, an enriching experience, you need to be able to take someone under your wing, you need to be able to challenge them, but you need to be able to make them grow. And I can't stand, I, I'm sorry, I can't stress that word enough, grow. If you can't make that person think in more advanced ways by nurturing that train of thought, if you can't make that person start getting involved in way more things and really grasping the flavor or the essence of all the stuff that we're doing, we're failing on that. And I think we got, we got very good people in here doing that kind of stuff. I've actually had an opportunity to interact with a lot of people that are in a mentorship position or in, um, in a four-minute position. And they're doing a great job. But we need more of them. And as, as long as we keep that exchange of information, that we keep our, uh, our ears open, and we keep that general openness in getting more people in here from different backgrounds, from different walks of life, in order to help us understand things that we don't understand, that's the only way that we're going to make it uh, out of life, out of this, out of this game. Okay. Thank you very much. That's about it. Any questions? Yes, sir. to that would be that's the reason why you need a risk model by by assessing you let me let me rephrase what you said it's an it's an exponential thing it what's it's I'm sorry it's an exponential value that has to do with money that you spend in, in securing things and how much how much danger is going to come your way did I say that right excellent the way I would do it or the way that I would approach it is that's the reason why you need to understand the risk model. Because if you understand the risk, you understand how much money you actually need to put into that risk in order to mitigate that. Now, it's, let me go back to the, the one-size-fits-all conundrum. That's the reason why you need a lot of, think about, um, uh, what's it called, um, the Nyquist theorem. You need, you need to get a lot of samples in order to make something uh, accurate. That's that's hardly you know putting that in the in the ball in the ball game, right? The more sampling, of, the more samples of information that you have about a single event, the more you're actually going to understand how it is. So in order to get in order to understand one risk, first of all, you need to get a lot of information about that risk. A. Number two, 
you need to reach a, you need to reach a common ground. We need to meet in the middle with the person that brought that risk up. Because you're going you're to have one perception of that risk. The person who put it on your table is going to have another perception of that risk. Maybe he thinks you need to spend way more money in order to, to get that risk down. But maybe you think the other way around. So maybe if you can actually get to a common ground to understand that risk, that is how, A, you're going to come up with a solid um, risk classification. And number two, you're going to come up with um, the right amount of money to get to that point, to get to the tipping point where you're you're at the optimal level of money spent and risk reduced. Does that answer the question? Thanks very much. Anybody else? Nope. Awesome. Well, that's it for CornCon Five. Thank you very much, and I hope you keep having a great, great conference. Thank you all for showing up.